For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 4B. In this video, I'm going to derive the theoretical maximum mass of a star. In the first video of the series, Stellar Physics 1A, I gave you what that maximum mass was, but told you that we didn't have enough physics under our belt to actually derive it. Well, now we actually have the physics necessary so we can derive this theoretical maximum mass. We're first going to find an equation of state for such a star, then we'll look at the criteria for equilibrium and stability and then we'll take those results to find the maximum star mass. The physics in this video will be heavily dependent on what we found in chapter 3, so it would be good to be familiar with that physics before watching this video. At the very least, you can watch the last video of that chapter, Stellar Physics 3G, which summarizes what we found in chapter 3. I've rated the physics level in this video as intermediate. So let's start off with finding an equation of state for what is called a supermassive star. As a general rule, the larger a star, the more radiation dominated it is, meaning that the pressure supporting the star against gravity is radiation pressure as opposed to gas pressure. We represent this mathematically by defining a variable beta, which is the fractional gas pressure, that is, the gas pressure divided by the total pressure, and we're going to assume almost 100% radiation pressure, so beta will be very close to zero. There's always some gas pressure, so it's never exactly zero. In Stellar Physics 2C, we found that the adiabatic index, gamma 1, for radiation-dominated environment, is a little bit over 4 thirds. Since these are radiation-dominated stars, they will be radiating at the Eddington luminosity, which I covered in Stellar Physics 1C, and is the luminosity a star would have if it were entirely supported by radiation pressure. In Stellar Physics 3B, we found a relationship between beta and the mass of a star. Here, mu is the average particle mass in units of a proton mass, and remember that this symbol, m with this subscript, signifies one solar mass. Since beta is very close to zero, we can ignore this beta up here because one minus beta will basically be one, and then solve for beta in terms of the mass of the star. In chapter three, we also found a general form for the internal energy per unit mass, so here, epsilon is the internal energy per unit mass, p is the pressure, rho is the density, and k is a constant, which will depend on the exact equation of state of the star. The total energy we found in chapter 3 will be the internal energy plus the Newtonian gravitational potential energy plus a weak field correction due to general relativity. Recall that we have to include this correction because we have a radiation-dominated star, and we found that the Newtonian binding energy, if you ignore GR, is exactly zero for radiation-dominated stars. These stars, even though they are entirely Newtonian in structure, meaning that GR is, for the most part, negligible, their binding energy and stability will be entirely determined by GR, because even if the effects of GR are tiny, tiny is still greater than zero. The star's total internal energy will be the internal energy per unit mass integrated over the mass of the star, which will have this general form. Kappa 1 is a numerical factor which results from integrating over a polytrope profile, and rho sub c is the central density. Now, kappa 1 is just a number, k we said is constant, the mass of the star doesn't change, so the only thing that can be varied here is the central density, so we can write this as some constant a times the central density raised to the gamma 1 minus 1. It's possible to figure out what a is, but we're going to see in a little bit that it actually doesn't matter. The Newtonian gravitational potential energy is simply taken from Newtonian's law of gravitation, which we found in the previous video, Stellar Physics 4a, to be gm squared over r, where r is the radius of the star, times this factor 3 over 5 minus n, where n is the polytrope index. And for a radiation-dominated star, n is equal to 3, so this factor will be 3 halves. We can rewrite the radius in terms of the mass and the density, to get that the gravitational potential energy will be negative of some constant b times the central density to the one third. These functions theta and c are taken from polytrope profile. If you don't know what they are, you can watch my video on polytropes, Stellar Physics 3b. For the purposes of this video, this entire factor is just a number. In Stellar Physics 3f, we derive the post Newtonian GR correction which we can also write as the negative of some constant c times the central density to the two-thirds. So now we have the total binding energy of the star as a function of the central density. Now we have to find the criteria for equilibrium and stability. 
And recall that we know what gamma 1 is in terms of beta, and we know what beta is in terms of the mass of the star. The equilibrium energy will be found by minimizing the energy with respect to the central density, as that's the only thing that can vary here, and that is found by setting its derivative equal to zero. I'll spare you the algebra, but this gives the following condition for the internal energy. So now I can plug this equation into my term for the internal energy to get an expression for the equilibrium energy. Recall from chapter 3 that a star is stable if its second derivative with respect to the central density at the equilibrium point is positive. So the critical point, which is when the GR instability sets in, is found by evaluating the second derivative at the equilibrium point and setting it to zero. Again, I'm going to spare you the algebra and just give you the result. So here all I did was take two derivatives of this equation, set it to zero, and then plug this condition in which leads to this equation for the central density. Now this term is going to be of order beta, because gamma 1 is 4 thirds plus beta over 6, so 3 gamma 1 minus 4 will be 3 times beta over 6. This second term comes from the GR correction, so this first factor is already small, and so we can simply set gamma 1 to 4 thirds here and ignore the correction of beta over 6, because that will be a higher order correction. So 3 gamma 1 minus 5, if gamma 1 is 4 thirds, is just negative 1. Now we solve this equation for the central density to get an expression for the critical density. So this is the central density when instability sets in. We can plug the critical density into our equation for the equilibrium energy to get an expression for the critical energy. We know what beta is, and we know what the constants b and c are, and so plugging everything in, we get that the critical density will be proportional to 1 divided by the mass of the star to the 7 halves. Interestingly, the critical energy does not depend on the mass of the star. This means that supermassive stars will all have the same energy when they go unstable, regardless of their mass. Mu is the mean particle mass, and for a supermassive star it's about 0.6. This is found by assuming primordial abundances, and I'll get into why that is in a little bit. And so we get that a supermassive star will go unstable when its binding energy is about the rest mass energy of the sun. If you're finding this video interesting so far, be sure to like and subscribe, maybe share it with a few friends. We now have everything we need to find the maximum mass of a star. In my video on polytropes, Stellar Physics 3b, we found a relationship between the temperature and the density. Again, we can plug in our expression for beta into here and ignore this one because 1 minus beta is going to be basically 1, and then set the central density to the critical density to find the critical temperature. So this is the central temperature when the star goes unstable. Now remember what a star is. It's a ball of gas that's supported against gravity by the energy released due to nuclear fusion inside of its core. And in order to fuse hydrogen into helium, you need a temperature of about 10 to the 7 Kelvin or more. So we can set the critical temperature to 10 to the 7 Kelvin and solve for the mass to find that the maximum mass of a star is about 2 million solar masses and the corresponding critical density is about 1 tenth the density of air. The luminosity of the star will be its Eddington luminosity, which comes out to about 100 billion times the luminosity of the sun. From this, it's fairly straightforward to derive the lifetime of this star. I'm not going to do it, but it works out to about a million years which is very short for a star. The sun, for example, has a lifetime of about 10 billion years. There are a few things we have to point out about supermassive stars. For one, if they ever existed, they would only be possible in what are called POP3 stars. POP3 stars are the first generation of stars, so they're the first stars made in the universe. They have never been observed, but they must have existed because at some point there has to have been the first stars made in the universe. And the reason for that is that they existed so long ago, and due to the expansion of the universe are so far away, that even if one were at this maximum limit and had a luminosity 100 billion times the luminosity of the sun, it's so far away that it would still be very difficult to detect with modern day telescopes. Now why does a supermassive star have to be a POP3 star? Well that's because POP3 stars have primordial abundances, meaning they're made up entirely of hydrogen and helium no heavier metals. Subsequent generations of stars will have heavier metals, and when there are heavier metals present in the star, they act as catalysts and increase the nuclear production rate, and so if you had a supermassive star with heavy elements in it, even a tiny amount, 
for example, the sun has less than 1% heavy metals in it, those heavy metals would drastically increase the nuclear production rate and the star would explode. I should also point out that most models put POP3 stars at about 100 to 1,000 solar masses, so still pretty far off from this maximum theoretical limit. And the largest known star that's ever been observed is about 250 solar masses. So again, we don't have any evidence that these supermassive stars ever existed. There is, however, possible circumstantial evidence that they once did exist. And that is the existence of supermassive black holes very early on in galaxy formation. So we have observed supermassive black holes well over a billion solar masses in very early galaxies. And the question now is, how were these supermassive black holes formed? Well, there's really two ways you can make a black hole. The standard way is through a collapsing star. But the problem is, if POP3 stars are somewhere between 100 and 1,000 solar masses, they're going to make a black hole of about that size, nowhere near a billion solar masses. So to get a billion solar mass black hole, you'd have to merge a bunch of these 100 or 1,000 solar mass black holes in a very short amount of time, because we observe these supermassive black holes very early on. And this doesn't seem very feasible. So it's proposed that maybe there were some supermassive stars that were of order maybe 10,000 to a million solar masses, and now you'll have C black holes around 100,000 solar masses, and it's much easier to pile those up in a short amount of time to get a billion solar mass black hole. Another possibility is supermassive black holes were made by what are called primordial black holes, which is an entirely different mechanism for making black holes that has nothing to do with stars. But I should also point out that those black holes have never been observed either. They're strictly theoretical. Another problem with supermassive stars is how do you make them? It's perfectly reasonable to have a gas cloud of, say, 100,000 or a million solar masses collapse. However, it's rather unlikely that this will collapse into one giant star. It's much more likely, instead of making one giant million solar mass star, it'll instead fragment and make a large cluster of a bunch of smaller stars. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe, and click the bell to be notified for future videos. Next, I want to derive the maximum mass of a white dwarf, which is called the Chandrasekhar limit, and revisit the maximum mass of a neutron star, which I already went over in Stellar Physics 3D. But before I do that, because both of these stars are made up of degenerate matter, I'm going to take one video to cover the thermodynamics of degenerate matter.